The Memory Den is the most unique set piece in Good Neighbor. This is where sad and lonely people go to relive moments of their past. The Memory Den is modeled off of the real-life Gordon's Scully Square Olympia Theater, which was built in 1913 but sadly demolished in the 1960s. It was a vaudeville theater with live stage performances that later switched to movies before being demolished. It was surprisingly hard to find photographs of the theater, and I was confused for a while because there's a theater right next to it, next to which you see the Rialto Theater, so two competing theaters right next door to each other, both in Scully Square. The Rialto was formerly known as the Star. The Olympia was first called the Olympia, but then its name was changed to simply Scully Square Theater. To complicate this even more, there was another theater in Scully Square called the Howard Athenaeum, also called the Old Howard Theater, which was the most famous of the theaters in Scully Square. But the distinguishing marquee that we recognize from the game came from the Olympia Theater. Incidentally, the Howard Theater was well known for having a lot of opera and high-class stage performances until after World War II, when it descended into burlesque. It was finally shut down after the Boston Vice Squad secretly recorded a burlesque performance inside the old Howard by a burlesque performer named Mary Goodneighbor, showing off her goods. And Mary Goodneighbor's nickname was Irma the Body. Irma the Body. So Bethesda clearly did their research. They gave the Memory Den the facade of the Olympia Theater, but they gave the matron of the Memory Den the name of the burlesque performer, Irma the Body, who worked out of the old Howard. The letters on the marquee read, Monday is Ladies' Night, Wednesday All-Star Vaudeville Review. It looks like in the Fallout universe, this theater continued to give vaudeville performances. The madame of this den is an aging woman named Irma. Her associate is a one Dr. Amari. She's the scientist responsible for the unique technology that allows the memory den to function. Don't bother asking me how the memory loungers work. I don't have time to teach the years of neurophysiology it would take you to understand. Before you ask, I wasn't responsible for the decor, so I don't want to hear it. The memory loungers are complex pieces of equipment. Please don't lean on, jump on, or kick them. You don't look like you need the memory den. Do you even know what we do here? Does it involve a back room and a handful of singles? Making it rain? Oh, you have the wrong idea, honey. I don't sell skin. I sell memories. And let me tell you, reliving an experience, the right experience, it's far more intense than anything else. But it's not for everyone. Well, this place looks like a drug den to me. <laughs> you sound like my partner. She never did like the drapes or the colors. But you're way off the mark. It's the memory den, not the drug den. We're obviously not what you're looking for. Something about memories? Oh, well, I'm glad to meet someone who pays attention to the name. That's right. We let you relive the past. Now, I hate to turn such a clever girl away, but we aren't accepting new clients right now. Why not? Look, it's no secret that reliving a memory can be about having a good time or helpful in remembering something you've forgotten or lost. But like anything worth doing in life, honey, it's got a kick to it, and the first time can be traumatic. So I keep the client list very small. People I trust. It helps us avoid a lot of unpleasantness. I'm sorry we couldn't help you, sweetheart. Maybe some other time. You're cautious. I respect that. But I think I can handle it. If you'll just give me a chance. I'm sorry. We have to be very selective, and we're just not looking for new clients now. Nothing's free. I know how it is. What if I paid a hundred caps up front? Persistence and money. Two things I love in a woman. I suppose I can give you a trial run. Now, memories involving other people are easiest. Recent events involving loved ones. Uh, does anything come to mind? Can it be about something else? Oh, this is a trial run. I want to see how you handle a clear memory. And in all my time doing this, nothing stands out like love and family. I can think of something, but I I don't feel comfortable talking about it. Well, if you don't want to tell me, that's fine. 
Just focus on it, okay? I lost my baby recently. Kidnapping. I'd do anything to see him again. A missing child. Oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry, sweetheart. My husband died recently. If I could just see him one last time. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. It's never easy losing someone that close to you. But I think we can help. All right, sit down in the lounger. Let's see what memory we can find. No matter what choices you make, there is only one memory from your past that you can relive. And of course, it's the one memory the sole survivor wishes to forget. Uh, Dr. Amari, we have a new client. Can you find a memory we can plug into? What kind of memory are we looking for? Just find the strongest imprint you can. All right. Scanning the hippocampus. I found something. Very recent. The sink with the temporal lobes is strong. Uh, that, that, that's the one. Lift the curtain, honey. It's showtime. Here you are. Your memory. Just relax. We'll be monitoring your vitals on this end. Manual override initiated. Cryogenic stasis suspended. Vault computers are still working. That's good. Checking through the logs. Hopefully it's all... Just... find it. Pod C6. Down the hall near the end. This is the one. Here. Open it. Is it Almost. Here? Everything's gonna be fine. Okay? Come here. No. Come here, Wait. baby. No. I've got him! Let the boy go. I'm only gonna tell you once. I'm not giving you Sean! God damn it. God. Get the kid out of here and let's go. At least we still have the backup. Cryogenic sequence reinitialized. We are reaching the end of the memory. Hold on. Try to calm down. Your blood pressure is spiking. I'll have you out of there in three, two, one. Easy there, sweetheart. Easy. I'm so, so sorry. If I had any idea that we were going to put you through that again, I would have said no. Wasn't there any other memory you could have found? I told you. We find the clearest memory we can for the first time. That one stood out. I will not be recommending this place to my friends. I'm sorry we couldn't help you, honey. You sat back and put me through that again. You owe me. You're right. Here, a small consideration for everything you've been through. Those people kidnapped my baby. I have to find them. Oh, I wouldn't even know where to start, honey. No, what, what you need is a detective. <laughs> I have a friend, Nick Valentine. He works out of Diamond City. Trust me, honey, he's the best. He can find anyone. This is the other way we can learn about Nick Valentine if we don't hear it from Piper first. Your memories of Vault 111? I'm so sorry we put you through that again. From here we go to Diamond City and search for the sleuth. But before we go, what are these memory loungers? Where do they come from and how do they work? Well, Irma is hush-hush. She plays coy when you ask about them. Where did the memory loungers come from, you ask? <laughs> Well, a girl's got to have her secrets. But the memory loungers bear a striking resemblance to the virtual reality pods from Fallout 3. When we come upon these pods in Vault 112 in Fallout 3, they are currently running an active simulation called Tranquility Lane. Instead of sending you to your own memories, 
stepping into these pods will send you into a virtual reality world space. The pods are actually a pre-war technology used as virtual reality simulators. They were used by scientists like the ones at Vault 112, but also by the military. If you go to the Nellis Air Force Base in Fallout New Vegas, you find these exact same virtual reality pods sitting in one of the hangars. These are used as flight simulators. The boomers use it to hone their flying skills in the hopes that one day they'll be able to find and recover a working bomber and be able to use it immediately. However, the memory loungers at the memory den are altered. It's likely that the machines reinvent scenes from your memory in virtual reality and then allow you to explore them. We get this impression when using the memory loungers to explore certain memories from a certain individual. Can you hear me? Ah, good. The simulation appears to be working, although the memories are quite fragmentary. I think this is likely a technology that Dr. Amari herself invented. Somehow Irma got her hands on these pre-war virtual reality pods and then Dr. Amari outfitted them to interpret human memories in virtual reality. Irma then uses these memory loungers to give lonely people a new kind of high. She charges people to come in and relive memories from their past for a small fee. But there is much more to the memory den. Let's finish exploring the building. The one red door against the western wall is the door that leads to Kent Conley's office. Kent Conley is an uber fan, a fan of the Silver Shroud. He broadcasts Silver Shroud radio from this room and is absolutely obsessed with the superhero. So much so that Irma has given him his own memory lounger, which we see here in his office that he uses exclusively to sit down and relive memories of listening to Silver Shroud Radio. I covered the story of Kent Conley and the Silver Shroud in full detail in my video on the Silver Shroud, which you can watch here. Heading back out and going towards the entrance, we find the ticket window. This looks like a place where new patrons would come to purchase tickets for the memory lounger. However, it's not manned. As we just saw, the way to access the memory lounger is just to walk right up to Irma. So it looks like it's an unused room. Inside, we find a pre-war cash register filled with pre-war money, a currency which is not used today. So it's likely just there for storage. The red door to the east underneath the restroom signs leads beneath the stairway that leads to floor two. There are some boxes and crates underneath the stairs, but nothing else of note. The door immediately in front of us just leads to a big empty storage room. Seems like a lot of wasted space. And then heading out and turning to the right, we find first the men's restroom and the women's restroom directly next to it. Nothing interesting here, although there is a big bucket in there, and that's disgusting. Ugh. Behind the Memory Den main chamber was the backstage area. The backstage area is incredibly tiny. It consists of one small hallway. Here we see the furniture that the old pre-war vaudeville performers used to put on their makeup and get ready for stage. It's a bit unrealistic. They would likely have had their own dressing rooms. Heading downstairs, we find a locked door. This door will remain locked until you get far enough in the main quest or until you find Curie. Dr. Amari is secretly affiliated with the railroad. I don't know if she's an actual member of the railroad. I wouldn't call her an agent, but she believes in the railroad's cause and she volunteers her expertise to the railroad to help them wipe the minds of synths. Her work and likely the work of Irma here at the Memory Den is a front for saving synths. The memory loungers themselves, while perfectly functional and very popular, are also a front to explain why a talent scientist who specializes in memory would be working here, because in reality, Dr. Amari's main job is to wipe synths' minds and give them new memories. Dr. Amari will wipe the mind of a synth. She'll then create a boring, regular, plain set of memories, and then use the memory lounger with the synth plugged in to convince that synth that the memories that he or she sees in the simulation are real. This is how a synth will be completely blindsided when he or she discovers that he's a synth because he actually lived through those memories in virtual reality, in the memory lounger. 
It's the perfect front, a seedy club in a slummy town frequented by drifters and lonely ingrates, run by a stereotypical madame in her chaise longue. And all the while, synths are killed and reborn in the basement. It's here in the basement where Dr. Amari allows us, with the help of Nick Valentine, to explore the memories of a certain someone. And it's also in this room where we bring Curie, whom we rescued from Vault 81, so that we can transfer her mind into the body of a synth who has become comatose. This is how Curie the robot becomes Curie the synth. Typically it's Glory who volunteers the body of the synth to Curie. However, if you've gone too far in the primary quest line and destroyed the railroad, then instead we find an otherwise unknown woman here named the Caretaker. This is a different caretaker from the one whom we meet at the Mercer safe house, which tells us that the railroad employs many different caretakers to help care for synths after they escape the Institute. Due to both Irma and Dr. Amari's strong railroad sympathies, they both have harsh words for you if you choose to side with the Institute. The memory den is no friend to the Institute, honey. And here, I thought you were so nice. The den has no business with the Institute. Not now. Not ever. So, you've joined the Institute. I suppose in the end, they always win. We have nothing to discuss. The Institute has no business here. Upstairs leads to Irma and Amari's private quarters. The first room is really plain. We find a bed with a terminal on a nearby desk and a doorway leading into the other room. In this room, we have a similar situation, just a plain bed, a few small pieces of furniture, but beside a bookshelf on the ground, we find the holotape password to Irma's terminal. Back in the other room, we can use the terminal to read some of Irma's personal notes on some of her customers. That's right, Irma apparently records the virtual reality simulation of the memories of her customers, and then watches the recordings later for her own amusement or possibly to blackmail her customers later, which is a huge breach of privacy. I wonder what her customers would say if they knew about this. Her first entry is on Kent Conley. She feels like she's being charitable to Kent. She can't imagine what it must be like to be over 200 years old like Kent is, and to have 200 years worth of memories. Kent practically lives at the memory den, and uses the memory lounger so much that Dr. Amari had to put safety settings into his personal memory lounger so that he doesn't starve himself to death. Irma pities the man so much, longing for a world that no longer exists that she says, as far as I'm concerned, if he wants to live out the rest of his days plugged in and occasionally waking up to eat and stare at his poster collection, that's his choice. The next patron we learn about is Hancock himself. Apparently, he was a handsome devil before he became a ghoul. Irma ends by saying that he knew how to have a good time. Fred Allen also frequents the memory den. This is the very Fred who's the chem merchant in the Hotel Rexford. The man comes in to relive memories of being stoned on other drugs. As Irma puts it, getting stoned on jet and then playing a memory of yourself being stoned on buff out while you're still stoned on jet well, you have to admire the man's commitment. Indeed you do, Irma. Indeed you do. Next up is Claire. You remember Claire? She's the front desk worker at the Hotel Rexford. Irma says that her memories are very vivid. Dr. Amari explains this by saying that Claire has one of those unique brains that have great attention to detail, which explains why she's so meticulous. Maybe this is Amari's way of telling us that she has a photographic memory. Irma says that her husband used to be really cute, and she can see why Claire misses him. It's sad to think that Claire comes here to use the memory lounger to relive memories of the time she spent with her dead husband. And the final patron in Irma's notes is Daisy. This is the ghoul merchant who gives you the quest to go to the Boston Public Library. Apparently, she's a staunch opponent to the memory den, but she comes in a few times anyway. Irma says, temptation gets us all in the end. Perhaps Daisy was against the idea of the memory den being here because she doesn't like the clientele that it attracts. Or maybe as a ghoul who is over 200 years old, she morally objects to the idea of living in the past. But for whatever reason, despite her vocal condemnation of the memory den, she comes in to sample the goods. Whatever is in Daisy's memories scares Irma 
She says, there's a reason Daisy has lived to a ripe old age. I don't ever want to see the Hellion side of Daisy coming out. After reading this terminal, I went to each of these characters to see if it unlocked any further dialogue, but sadly, none of them talk about the memories that they explore here in the memory den. If you try to come back to Irma to use the memory lounger again, she says no. The memory den's not accepting new clients right now, sweetheart. Oh, enjoying yourself and good neighbor? It's a heck of a town, ain't it? You take care, sweetheart. Maybe it's because you had such a bad experience last time and Irma doesn't want to be responsible for causing you any more pain. And if you end the game by destroying the Institute, no matter which faction you use to do so, Dr. Amari thanks you. The Institute is finally gone. We can all breathe easier without them lurking behind everyone's lives. Thank you. She's also a sweet person, concerned with your well-being. After all, she dredged up a painful memory. She then forced your mind into the mind of a dead man and worked closely with you. She pities your sad story and looks out for your well-being. And if you do the railroad quest, remember it's here at the memory den where we find H-222, just after Dr. Amari completely erased his memory. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of the memory den in Good Neighbor. It plays a key and crucial role in the main questline, and it's touched by a number of other important side quests in the game. It's a beautiful homage to the real Olympia Theater in Scully Square, and it's a fun reminder of Tranquility Lane in Fallout 3. What are your thoughts on the memory den? Did you work closely with Dr. Amari, or in the end, did you side with the Institute and betray her? What do you think of Irma and Amari's opinion of the Institute? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. I'm finishing up a big series on Good Neighbor. We're gonna do a big video on the history of Good Neighbor and then a big character profile of Hancock. I publish a new video six days a week, so if you wanna make sure that you don't miss these videos on Good Neighbor, be sure to subscribe and to hit that notification bell button. And have you had a chance to check out my t-shirt shop yet? The fine folks over at Teespring have worked closely with me to design some fun and interesting Oxhorn and Fallout 4 images with some of your favorite factions and quotes. If you're interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you'd like to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video today. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.